Chapter 3 of Xerxes Debate on the Proposed Invasion of Greece, B.C. 481 The two great counselors on whose judgment Xerxes mainly relied, so far as he looked to any other judgment than his own, in the formation of his plans, were Artabanus, the uncle by whose decision the throne had been awarded to him, and Mardonius, the commander-in-chief of his armies. Xerxes himself was quite a young man, of a proud and lofty yet generous character, and full of self-confidence and hope. Mardonius was much older, but he was a soldier by profession, and was eager to distinguish himself in some great military campaign. It has always been unfortunate for the peace and happiness of mankind under all monarchical and despotic governments in every age of the world that through some depraved and unaccountable perversion of public sentiment, those who are not born to greatness have had no means of attaining it except as heroes in war. Many men have, indeed, by their mental powers or their moral excellences, acquired an extended and lasting posthumous fame, but in respect to all immediate and exalted distinction and honor, it will be found, on reviewing the history of the human race, that there have generally been but two possible avenues to them, on the one hand, high birth, and on the other, the performance of great deeds of carnage and destruction. There must be, it seems, as the only valid claim to renown, either blood inherited or blood shed. The glory of the latter is second, indeed, to that of the former, but it is only second. He who has sacked a city stands very high in the estimation of his fellows. He yields precedence only to him whose grandfather sacked one. This state of things is now, it is true, rapidly undergoing a change. The age of chivalry, of military murder and robbery, and of the glory of great deeds of carnage and blood is passing away. And that of peace, of industry, and of achievements for promoting the comfort and happiness of mankind is coming. The men who are now advancing to the notice of the world are those who, through their commerce or their manufactures, feed and clothe their fellow men by millions, or by opening new channels or new means for international intercourse, civilize savages and people deserts. While the glory of killing and destroying is less and less regarded, and more and more readily forgotten. In the days of Xerxes, however, there was no road to honor but by war, and Mardonius found that his only hope of rising to distinction was by conducting a vast torrent of military devastation over some portion of the globe, and the fairer the richer, the happier this scene which he was thus to inundate and overwhelm, the greater would be the glory. He was very much disposed, therefore, to urge on the invasion of Greece by every means in his power. Artabanus, on the other hand, the uncle of Xerxes, was a man advanced in years and of a calm and cautious disposition. He was better aware than younger men of the vicissitudes and hazards of war, and was much more inclined to restrain than to urge on the youthful ambition of his nephew. Xerxes had been able to present some show of reason for his campaign in Egypt by calling the resistance which that country offered to his power a rebellion. There was, however, no such reason in the case of Greece. There had been two wars between Persia and the Athenians already, it is true. In the first, the Athenians had aided their countrymen in Asia Minor in a fruitless attempt 
to recover their independence. This the Persian government considered as aiding and abetting a rebellion. In the second, the Persians under Datus, one of Darius's generals, had undertaken a grand invasion of Greece, and after landing in the neighborhood of Athens, were beaten with immense slaughter at the great battle of Marathon near that city. The former of these wars is known in history as the Ionian Rebellion, the latter as the first Persian invasion of Greece. They had both occurred during the reign of Darius, and the invasion under Datus had taken place not many years before the accession of Xerxes, so that a great number of the officers who had served in that campaign were still remaining in the court and army of Xerxes at Susa. These wars had, however, both been terminated, and Artabanus was very little inclined to have the contests renewed. Xerxes, however, was bent upon making one more attempt to conquer Greece, and when the time arrived for commencing his preparations, he called a grand council of the generals, the nobles, and the potentates of the realm to lay his plans before them. The historian who narrated these proceedings recorded the debate that ensued in the following manner. Xerxes himself first addressed the assembly to announce and explain his designs. The enterprise, my friends, said he, in which I propose now to engage and in which I am about to ask your cooperation is no new scheme of my own devising. What I design to do is, on the other hand, only the carrying forward of the grand course of measures marked out by my predecessors and pursued by them with steadiness and energy so long as the power remained in their hands. That power has now descended to me, and with it has devolved the responsibility of finishing the work which they so successfully began. It is the manifest destiny of Persia to rule the world. From the time that Cyrus first commenced the work of conquest by subduing Media to the present day, the extent of our empire has been continually widening, until now it covers all of Asia and Africa, with the exception of the remote and barbarous tribes that, like the wild beasts which share their forests with them, are not worth the trouble of subduing. These vast conquests have been made by the courage, the energy, and the military power of Cyrus, Darius, and Cambyses, my renowned predecessors. They, on their part, have subdued Asia and Africa. Europe remains. It devolves on me to finish what they have begun. Had my father lived, he would himself have completed the work. He had already made great preparations for the undertaking, but he died, leaving the task to me, and it is plain that I cannot hesitate to undertake it without a manifest dereliction of duty. You all remember the unprovoked and wanton aggressions which the Athenians committed against us in the time of the Ionian Rebellion, taking part against us with rebels and enemies. They crossed the Aegean Sea on that occasion, invaded our territories, and at last captured and burned the city of Sardis, the principal capital of our Western Empire. I will never rest until I have had my revenge by burning Athens. Many of you, too, who are here present, remember the fate of the expedition under Datus. Those of you who were attached to that expedition will have no need that I should urge you to seek revenge for your own wrongs. I am sure that you will all second my undertaking with the utmost fidelity and zeal. My plan for gaining access to the Grecian territories is not as before, to convey the troops by a fleet of galleys 
over the Aegean Sea, but to build a bridge across the Hellespont and march the army to Greece by land. This course, which I am well convinced is practicable, will be more safe than the other, and the bridging of the Hellespont will be of itself a glorious deed. The Greeks will be utterly unable to resist the enormous force which we shall be able to pour upon them. We cannot but conquer, and inasmuch as beyond the Greek territories there is, as I am informed, no other power at all able to cope with us, we shall easily extend our empire on every side to the sea, and thus the Persian dominion will cover the whole habitable world. I am sure that I can rely on your cordial and faithful cooperation in these plans, and that each one of you will bring me from his own province or territories as large a quota of men and of supplies for the war as is in his power. They who contribute thus most liberally I shall consider as entitled to the highest honors and rewards. Such was, in substance, the address of Xerxes to his council. He concluded by saying that it was not his wish to act in the affair in an arbitrary or absolute manner, and he invited all present to express with perfect freedom any opinions or views which they entertained in respect to the enterprise. While Xerxes had been speaking, the soul of Mardonius had been on fire with excitement and enthusiasm, and every word which the king had uttered only fanned the flame. He rose immediately when the king gave permission to the counselors to speak, and earnestly seconded the monarch's proposals in the following words. For my part, sire, I cannot refrain from expressing my high admiration of the lofty spirit and purpose on your part, which leads you to propose to us an enterprise so worthy of your illustrious station and exalted personal renown. Your position and power at the present time are higher than those ever attained by any human sovereign that has ever lived, and it is easy to foresee that there is a career of glory before you which no future monarch can ever surpass. You are about to complete the conquest of the world. That exploit can, of course, never be exceeded. We all admire the proud spirit on your part, which will not submit tamely to the aggressions and insults which we have received from the Greeks. We have conquered the people of India, of Egypt, of Ethiopia, and of Assyria, and that too without having previously suffered any injury from them, but solely from a noble love of dominion. And shall we tamely stop in our career when we see nations opposed to us, from whom we have received so many insults and endured so many wrongs? Every consideration of honor and manliness forbids it. We have nothing to fear in respect to the success of the enterprise in which you invite us to engage. I know the Greeks, and I know that they cannot stand against our arms. I have encountered them many times and in various ways. I met them in the provinces of Asia Minor, and you all know the result. I met them during the reign of Darius, your father, in Macedon and Thrace, or rather sought to meet them, for though I marched through the country, the enemy always avoided me. They could not be found. They have a great name, it is true, but in fact all their plans and arrangements are governed by imbecility and folly. They are not ever united among themselves 
as they speak one common language, any ordinary prudence and sagacity would lead them to combine together and make common cause against the nations that surround them. Instead of this, they are divided into a multitude of petty states and kingdoms, and all their resources and power are exhausted in fruitless contentions with each other. I am convinced that, once across the Hellespont, we can march to Athens without finding any enemy to oppose our progress, or if we should encounter any resisting force, it will be so small and insignificant as to be instantly overwhelmed. In one point, Mardonius was nearly right in his predictions, since it proved subsequently, as will hereafter be seen, that when the Persian army reached the pass of Thermopylae, which was the great avenue of entrance on the north into the territories of the Greeks, they found only three hundred men ready there to oppose their passage. When Mardonius had concluded his speech, he sat down, and quite a solemn pause ensued. The nobles and chieftains generally were less ready than he to encounter the hazards and uncertainties of so distant a campaign. Xerxes would acquire, by the success of the enterprise, a great accession to his wealth and to his dominion, and Mardonius, too, might expect to reap very rich rewards, but what were they themselves to gain? They did not dare, however, to seem to oppose the wishes of the king, and notwithstanding the invitation which he had given them to speak, they remained silent, not knowing, in fact, exactly what to say. All this time Artabanus, the venerable uncle of Xerxes, sat silent like the rest, hesitating whether his years, his rank, and the relation which he sustained to the young monarch would justify his interposing and make it prudent and safe for him to attempt to warn his nephew of the consequences which he would hazard by indulging his dangerous ambition. At length he determined to speak. I hope, said he, addressing the king, that it will not displease you to have other views presented, in addition to those which have already been expressed. It is better that all opinions should be heard. The just and the true will then appear the more just and true by comparison with others. It seems to me that the enterprise which you contemplate is full of danger and should be well considered before it is undertaken. When Darius, your father, conceived of the plan of his invasion of the country of the Scythians beyond the Danube, I counseled him against the attempt. The benefits to be secured by such an undertaking seemed to me wholly insufficient to compensate for the expense, the difficulties, and the dangers of it. My counsels were, however, overruled. Your father proceeded on the enterprise. He crossed the Bosporus, traversed Thrace, and then crossed the Danube. But after a long and weary contest with the hordes of savages which he found in those trackless wilds, he was forced to abandon the undertaking and return with the loss of half his army. The plan which you propose seems to me to be liable to the same dangers, and I fear very much that it will lead to the same results. The Greeks have the name of being a valiant and formidable foe. It may prove, in the end, that they are so. They certainly repulsed Dadas and all his forces, vast as they were, and compelled them to retire with an enormous loss. Your invasion, I grant, will be more formidable than his. You will throw a bridge across the Hellespont, so as to take your troops round through the northern parts of Europe into Greece, and you will also, at the same time, have a powerful fleet in the Aegean Sea. But it must be remembered 
that the naval armaments of the Greeks in all those waters are very formidable. They may attack and destroy your fleet. Suppose that they should do so, and that then, proceeding to the northward in triumph, they should enter the Hellespont and destroy your bridge. Your retreat would be cut off, and in case of a reverse of fortune, your army would be exposed to total ruin. Your father, in fact, very narrowly escaped precisely this fate. The Scythians came to destroy his bridge across the Danube while his forces were still beyond the river, and had it not been for the very extraordinary fidelity and zeal of Histiaeus, who had been left to guard the post, they would have succeeded in doing it. It is frightful to think that the whole Persian army, with the sovereign of the empire at their head, were placed in a position where their being saved from overwhelming and total destruction depended solely on the fidelity and firmness of a single man. Should you place your forces and your own person in the same danger, can you safely calculate upon the same fortunate escape? Even the very vastness of your force may be the means of ensuring and accelerating its destruction, since whatever rises to extraordinary elevation and greatness is always exposed to dangers correspondingly extraordinary and great. Thus tall trees and lofty towers seem always specially to invite the thunderbolts of heaven. Mardonius charges the Greeks with a want of sagacity, efficiency, and valor, and speaks contemptuously of them as soldiers in every respect. I do not think that such imputations are just to the people against whom they are directed, or honorable to him who makes them. To disparage the absent, especially an absent enemy, is not magnanimous or wise, and I very much fear that it will be found in the end that the conduct of the Greeks will evince very different military qualities from those which Mardonius has assigned them. They are represented by common fame as sagacious, hardy, efficient, and brave, and it may prove that these representations are true. My counsel, therefore, is that you dismiss this assembly and take further time to consider this subject before coming to a final decision. Perhaps on more mature reflection you will conclude to abandon the project altogether. If you should not conclude to abandon it, but should decide, on the other hand, that it must be prosecuted, let me entreat you not to go yourself in company with the expedition. Let Mardonius take the charge and the responsibility. If he does so, I predict that he will leave the dead bodies of the soldiers that you entrust to him to be devoured by dogs on the plains of Athens or Lacedaemon. Xerxes was exceedingly displeased at hearing such a speech as this from his uncle, and he made a very angry reply. He accused Artabanus of meanness of spirit and of a cowardice disgraceful to his rank and station. In thus advocating a tame submission to the arrogant pretensions of the Greeks, were it not, he said, for the respect which he felt for Artabanus as his father's brother, he would punish him severely for his presumption in thus basely opposing his sovereign's plans. As it is, continued he, I will carry my plans into effect, but you shall not have the honor of accompanying me. You shall remain at Susa, with the women and children of the palace, and spend your time in the effeminate and ignoble pleasures suited to a spirit so mean. As for myself, I must and will carry my designs into execution. I could not, in fact, long avoid a contest with the Greeks, even if I were to adopt 
the cowardly and degrading policy which you recommend, for I am confident that they will very soon invade my dominions if I do not anticipate them by invading theirs. So saying, Xerxes dismissed the assembly. His mind, however, was not at ease. Though he had so indignantly rejected the counsel which Artabanus had offered him, yet the impressive words in which it had been uttered, and the arguments with which it had been enforced, weighed upon his spirit, and oppressed and dejected him. The longer he considered the subject, the more serious his doubts and fears became, until at length, as the night approached, he became convinced that Artabanus was right, and that he himself was wrong. His mind found no rest until he came to the determination to abandon the project after all. He resolved to make this change in his resolution known to Artabanus and his nobles in the morning, and to countermand the orders which he had given for the assembling of the troops. Having by this decision restored something like repose to his agitated mind, he laid himself down upon his couch and went to sleep. In the night he saw a vision. It seemed to him that a resplendent and beautiful form appeared before him, and after regarding him a moment with an earnest look, addressed him as follows. And do you really intend to abandon your deliberate design of leading an array into Greece, after having formally announced it to the realm, and issued your orders? Such fickleness is absurd, and will greatly dishonor you. Resume your plan, and go on boldly and perseveringly to the execution of it. So saying, the vision disappeared. When Xerxes awoke in the morning, and the remembrance of the events of the preceding day returned, mingling itself with the new impressions which had been made by the dream, he was again agitated and perplexed. As, however, the various influences which pressed upon him settled to their final equilibrium, the fears produced by Artabanus's substantial arguments and warnings on the preceding day proved to be of greater weight than the empty appeal to his pride which had been made by the phantom of the night. He resolved to persist in the abandonment of his scheme. He called his council accordingly together again, and told them that, on more mature reflection, he had become convinced that his uncle was right, and that he himself had been wrong. The project, therefore, was for the present suspended, and the orders for the assembling of the forces were revoked. The announcement was received by the members of the council with the most tumultuous joy. That night Xerxes had another dream. The same spirit appeared to him again. His countenance, however, bearing now, instead of the friendly look of the preceding night, a new and stern expression of displeasure. Pointing menacingly at the frightened monarch with his finger, he exclaimed, You have rejected my advice. You have abandoned your plan, and now I declare to you that, unless you immediately resume your enterprise and carry it forward to the end, short as has been the time since you were raised to your present elevation, a still shorter period shall elapse before your downfall and destruction. The spirit then disappeared as suddenly as it came, leaving Xerxes to awake in an agony of terror. As soon as it was day, Xerxes sent for Artabanus and related to him his dreams. I was willing, said he, after hearing what you said and maturely considering the subject, to give up my plan. But these dreams, I cannot but think, are intimations from heaven that I ought to proceed. Artabanus attempted to combat this idea by presenting to Xerxes that dreams were not to be regarded 
as indications of the will of heaven, but only as a vague and disordered reproduction of the waking thoughts, while the regular action of the reason and the judgment by which they were ordinarily controlled was suspended or disturbed by the influence of slumber. Xerxes maintained, on the other hand, that though this view of the case might explain his first vision, the solemn repetition of the warning proved that it was supernatural and divine. He proposed that, to put the reality of the apparition still further to the test, Artabanus should take his place on the royal couch the next night to see if the specter would not appear to him. You shall clothe yourself, said he, in my robes, put the crown upon your head, and take your seat upon the throne. After that, you shall retire to my apartment, lie down upon the couch, and go to sleep. If the vision is supernatural, it will undoubtedly appear to you. If it does not so appear, I will admit that it was nothing but a dream. Artabanus made some objection at first to the details of the arrangement which Xerxes proposed, as he did not see, he said, of what advantage it could be for him to assume the guise and habiliments of the king. If the vision was divine, it could not be deceived by such artifices as those. Xerxes, however, insisted on his proposition, and Artabanus yielded. He assumed for an hour the dress and the station of the king, and then retired to the king's apartment and laid himself down upon the couch under the royal pavilion. As he had no faith in the reality of the vision, his mind was quiet and composed, and he soon fell asleep. At midnight, Xerxes, who was lying in an adjoining apartment, was suddenly aroused by a loud and piercing cry from the room where Artabanus was sleeping, and in a moment afterward Artabanus himself rushed in, perfectly wild with terror. He had seen the vision. It had appeared before him with a countenance and gestures expressive of great displeasure, and after loading him with reproaches for having attempted to keep Xerxes back from his proposed expedition into Greece, it attempted to bore out his eyes with a red-hot iron with which it was armed. Artabanus had barely succeeded in escaping by leaping from his couch and rushing precipitately out of the room. Artabanus said that he was now convinced and satisfied it was plainly the divine will that Xerxes should undertake his projected invasion, and he would himself thenceforth aid the enterprise by every means in his power. The council was accordingly once more convened. The story of the three apparitions was related to them, and the final decision announced that the armies were to be assembled for the march without any further delay. It is proper here to repeat once for all in this volume a remark which has elsewhere often been made in the various works of this series, that in studying ancient history at the present day, it is less important now to know, in regard to transactions so remote, what the facts actually were which really occurred, than it is to know the story respecting them, which for the last two thousand years has been in circulation among mankind. It is now, for example, of very little consequence whether there ever was or never was such a personage as Hercules, but it is essential that every educated man should know the story which ancient writers tell in relating his doings. In this view of the case, our object in this volume is simply to give the history of Xerxes just as it stands, without stopping to separate the false from the true. In relating the occurrences, therefore, which have been described in this chapter, we simply give the alleged facts to our readers 
precisely as the ancient historians give them to us, leaving each reader to decide for himself how far he will believe the narrative. In respect to this particular story, we will add that some people think that Mardonius was really the ghost by whose appearance Artabanus and Xerxes were so dreadfully frightened. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Xerxes Preparations for the Invasion of Greece, B.C. 481 As soon as the invasion of Greece was finally decided upon, the orders were transmitted to all the provinces of the empire requiring the various authorities and powers to make the necessary preparations. There were men to be levied, arms to be manufactured, ships to be built, and stores of food to be provided. The expenditures, too, of so vast an armament as Xerxes was intending to organize would require a large supply of money. For all these things Xerxes relied on the revenues and the contributions of the provinces, and orders, very full and very imperative, were transmitted accordingly to all the governors and satraps of Asia, and especially to those who ruled over the countries which lay near the western confines of the empire and consequently near the Greek frontiers. In modern times, it is the practice of powerful nations to accumulate arms and munitions of war on storage in arsenals and naval depots, so that the necessary supplies for very extended operations, whether of attack or defense, can be procured in a very short period of time. In respect to funds, too, modern nations have a great advantage over those of former days in case of any sudden emergency arising to call for great and unusual expenditures. In consequence of the vast accumulation of capital in the hands of private individuals and the confidence which is felt in the mercantile honor and good faith of most established governments at the present day, these governments can procure indefinite supplies of gold and silver at any time by promising to pay an annual interest in lieu of the principal borrowed. It is true that in these cases a stipulation is made by which the government may, at a certain specified period, pay back the principal, and so extinguish the annuity. But in respect to a vast portion of the amount so borrowed, it is not expected that this repayment will ever be made. The creditors, in fact, do not desire that it should be, as owners of property always prefer a safe annual income from it to the custody of the principal and thus governments in good credit have sometimes induced their creditors to abate the rate of interest which they were receiving by threatening otherwise to pay the debt in full. These inventions, however, by which a government in one generation may enjoy the pleasure and reap the glory of waging war and throw the burden of the expense on another, were not known in ancient times. Xerxes did not understand the art of funding a national debt, and there would, besides, have probably been very little confidence in Persian stocks, if any had been issued. He had to raise all his funds by actual taxation, and to have his arms and his ships and chariots of war manufactured express the food to, to sustain the immense army which he was to raise was all to be produced and storehouses were to be built for the accumulation and custody of it. All this, as might naturally be expected, 
would require time, and the vastness of the scale on which these immense preparations were made is evinced by the fact that four years were the time allotted for completing them. This period includes, however, a considerable time before the great debate on the subject described in the last chapter. The chief scene of activity during all this time was the tract of country in the western part of Asia Minor and along the shores of the Aegean Sea. Taxes and contributions were raised from all parts of the empire, but the actual material of war was furnished mainly from those provinces which were nearest to the future scene of it. Each district provided such things as it naturally and most easily produced. One contributed horses, another arms and ammunition, another ships, and another provisions. The ships which were built were of various forms and modes of construction, according to the purposes which they were respectively intended to serve. Some were strictly ships of war intended for actual combat. Others were transports, their destination being simply the conveyance of troops or of military stores. There were also a large number of vessels which were built on a peculiar model prescribed by the engineers, being very long and straight-sided, and smooth and flat upon their decks. These were intended for the bridge across the Hell's Pond. They were made long, so that when placed side by side across the stream, a greater breadth might be given to the platform of the bridge. All these things were very deliberately and carefully planned, although it was generally on the Asiatic side of the Aegean Sea that these vast works of preparation were going on, and the crossing of the Hellespont was to be the first great movement of the Persian army, the reader must not suppose that, even at this time, the European shores were wholly in the hands of the Greeks. The Persians had, long before, conquered Thrace and a part of Macedon, and thus the northern shores of the Aegean Sea and many of the islands were already in Xerxes' hands. The Greek dominions lay further south, and Xerxes did not anticipate any opposition from the enemy until his army, after crossing the strait, should have advanced to the neighborhood of Athens. In fact, all the northern country through which his route would lie was already in his hands, and in passing through it he anticipated no difficulties, except as should arise from the elements themselves and the physical obstacles of the way. The Hellespont itself was, of course, one principal point of danger. The difficulty here was to be surmounted by the bridge of boats. There was, however, another point which was, in some respects, still more formidable. It was the promontory of Mount Athos. By looking at the map of Greece, placed at the commencement of the next chapter, the reader will see that there are two or three singular promontories jutting out from the main land in the northwestern part of the Aegean Sea. The most northerly and the largest of these was formed by an immense mountainous mass rising out of the water and connected by a narrow isthmus with the main land. The highest summit of this rocky pile was called Mount Athos in ancient times and is so marked upon the map. In modern days, it is called Mont Santo or Holy Mountain, being covered with monasteries and convents and other ecclesiastical establishments built in the Middle Ages. Mount Athos is very celebrated in ancient history. It extended along the promontory for many miles and terminated abruptly in lofty cliffs and precipices toward the sea, where it was so high that its shadow, as was said, was thrown at sunset 
across the water to the island of Lemnos, a distance of twenty leagues. It was a frightful specter in the eyes of the ancient navigators, when as they came coasting along from the north in their frail galleys on their voyages to Greece and Italy, they saw it frowning defiance to them as they came, with threatening clouds hanging upon its summit, and the surges and surf of the Aegean perpetually thundering upon its base below. To make this stormy promontory the more terrible, it was believed to be the haunt of innumerable uncouth and misshapen monsters of the sea that lived by devouring the hapless seamen who were thrown upon the rocks from their wrecked vessels by the merciless tumult of the waves. The plan which Xerxes had formed for the advance of his expedition was that the army which was to cross the Hellespont by the bridge should advance thence through Macedonia and Thessaly by land, attended by a squadron of ships, transports, and galleys, which was to accompany the expedition along the coast by sea, the men could be marched more conveniently to their place of destination by land. The stores, on the other hand, the arms, the supplies, and the baggage of every description could be transported more easily by sea. Mardonius was somewhat solicitous in respect to the safety of the great squadron which would be required for this latter service in doubling the promontory of Mount Athos. In fact, he had special and personal reason for his solicitude, for he had himself some years before met with a terrible disaster at this very spot. It was during the reign of Darius that this disaster occurred. On one of the expeditions which Darius had entrusted to his charge, he was conducting a very large fleet along the coast, when a sudden storm arose just as he was approaching this terrible promontory. He was on the northern side of the promontory when the storm came on, and as the wind was from the north, it blew directly upon the shore. For the fleet to make its escape from the impending danger, it seemed necessary, therefore, to turn the course of the ships back against the wind. But this, on account of the sudden and terrific violence of the gale, it was impossible to do. The sails, when they attempted to use them, were blown away by the howling gusts, and the oars were broken to pieces by the tremendous dashing of the sea. It soon appeared that the only hope of escape for the squadron was to press on in the desperate attempt to double the promontory, and thus gain, if possible, the sheltered water under its lee. The galleys accordingly went on, the pilots and the seamen exerting their utmost to keep them away from the shore. All their efforts, however, to do this were vain. The merciless gales drove the vessels one after another upon the rocks and dashed them to pieces, while the raging sea wrenched the wretched mariners from the wrecks to which they attempted to cling and tossed them out into the boiling whirlpools around to the monsters that were ready there to devour them, as if she were herself some ferocious monster feeding her offspring with their proper prey. A few, it is true, of the hapless wretches succeeded in extricating themselves from the surf by crawling up upon the rocks through the tangled seaweed until they were above the reach of the surges, but when they had done so, they found themselves hopelessly imprisoned between the impending precipices which frowned above them and the frantic billows which were raging and roaring below. They gained, of course, by their apparent escape, only a brief prolongation of suffering, for they all soon miserably perished from exhaustion, exposure, and cold. Mardonius had no desire to encounter this danger again. Now the promontory of Mount Athos, 
though high and rocky itself, was connected with the mainland by an isthmus level and low, and not very broad. Xerxes determined on cutting a canal through this isthmus so as to take his fleet of galleys across the neck and thus avoid the stormy navigation of the outward passage. Such a canal would be of service not merely for the passage of the great fleet, but for the constant communication which it would be necessary for Xerxes to maintain with his own dominions during the whole period of the invasion. It might have been expected that the Greeks would have interfered to prevent the execution of such a work as this, but it seems that they did not, and yet there was a considerable Greek population in that vicinity. The promontory of Athos itself was quite extensive, being about thirty miles long and four or five wide, and it had several towns upon it. The canal which Xerxes was to cut across the neck of this peninsula was to be wide enough for two triremes to pass each other. Triremes were galleys propelled by three banks of oars and were vessels of the largest class ordinarily employed, and as the oars by which they were impelled required almost as great a breadth of water as the vessels themselves, the canal was consequently to be very wide. The engineers accordingly laid out the ground, and marking the boundaries by stakes and lines as guides to the workmen, the excavation was commenced. Immense numbers of men were set at work, arranged regularly in gangs, according to the various nations which furnished them. As the excavation gradually proceeded, and the trench began to grow deep, they placed ladders against the sides, and stationed a series of men upon them. Then the earth dug from the bottom was hauled up from one to another in a sort of basket or hod until it reached the top, where it was taken by other men and conveyed away. The work was very much interrupted and impeded in many parts of the line by the continual caving in of the banks on account of the workmen attempting to dig perpendicularly down in one section the one which had been assigned to the Phoenicians, this difficulty did not occur, for the Phoenicians, more considerate than the rest, had taken the precaution to make the breadth of their part of the trench twice as great at the top as it was below. By this means, the banks on each side were formed to a gradual slope and consequently stood firm. The canal was at length completed, and the water was let in. North of the promontory of Mount Athos, the reader will find upon the map the river Strymon, flowing south, not far from the boundary between Macedon and Thrace, into the Aegean Sea. The army of Xerxes, in its march from the Hellespont, would, of course, have to cross this river, and Xerxes, having by cutting the canal across the isthmus of Mount Athos, removed an obstacle in the way of his fleet, resolved next to facilitate the progress of his army by bridging the Strymon. The king also ordered a great number of granaries and storehouses to be built at various points along the route, which it was intended that his army should pursue. Some of these were on the coasts of Macedonia and Thrace, and some on the banks of the Strymon. To these magazines, the corn raised in Asia for the use of the expedition was conveyed, from time to time, in transport ships, as fast as it was ready, and being safely deposited, was protected by a guard. No very extraordinary means of defense seems to have been thought necessary at these points, for although the scene of all these preliminary arrangements was on the European side of the line and in what was called Greek territory, still this part of the country had been long under Persian dominion. 
The independent states and cities of Greece were all further south, and the people who inhabited them did not seem disposed to interrupt these preparations. Perhaps they were not aware to what object and end all these formidable movements on their northern frontier were tending. Xerxes, during all this time, had remained in Persia. The period at length arrived when his preparations on the frontiers being far advanced toward completion, he concluded to move forward at the head of his forces to Sardis. Sardis was the great capital of the western part of his dominions, and was situated not far from the frontier. He accordingly assembled his forces, and taking leave of his capital of Susa, with much parade and many ceremonies, he advanced toward Asia Minor. Entering and traversing Asia Minor, he crossed the Halys, which had been in former times the western boundary of the empire, though its limits had now been extended very far beyond. Having crossed the Halys, the immense procession advanced into Phrygia. A very romantic tale is told of an interview between Xerxes and a certain nobleman named Pythias, who resided in one of the Phrygian towns. The circumstances were these. After crossing the Halys, which river flows north into the Euxine Sea, the army went on to the westward through nearly the whole extent of Phrygia, until at length they came to the sources of the streams which flowed west into the Aegean Sea. One of the most remarkable of these rivers was the Meander. There was a town built exactly at the source of the Meander, so exactly, in fact, that the fountain from which the stream took its rise was situated in the public square of the town, walled in and ornamented like an artificial fountain in a modern city. The name of this town was Selene. When the army reached Selene and encamped there, Pythias made a great entertainment for the officers, which, as the number was very large, was of course attended with an enormous expense. Not satisfied with this, Pythias sent word to the king that if he was in any respect in want of funds for his approaching campaign, he, Pythias, would take great pleasure in supplying him. Xerxes was surprised at such proofs of wealth and munificence from a man in comparatively a private station. He inquired of his attendants who Pythias was. They replied that, next to Xerxes himself, he was the richest man in the world. They said, moreover, that he was as generous as he was rich. He had made Darius a present of a beautiful model of a fruit tree and of a vine of solid gold. He was by birth, they added, a Lydian. Lydia was west of Phrygia and was famous for its wealth. The river Pactolus, which was so celebrated for its golden sands, flowed through the country, and as the princes and nobles contrived to monopolize the treasures which were found, both in the river itself and in the mountains from which it flowed, some of them became immensely wealthy. Xerxes was astonished at the accounts which he heard of Pythias's fortune. He sent for him and asked him what was the amount of his treasures. This was rather an ominous question, for under such despotic governments as those of the Persian kings, the only real safeguard of wealth was often the concealment of it. Inquiry on the part of a government in respect to treasures accumulated by a subject was often only a preliminary to the seizure and confiscation of them. Pythias, however, in reply to the king's question, said that he had no hesitation in giving his majesty full information in respect to his fortune. He had been making, he said, a careful calculation of the amount of it with a view of determining how much he could offer to contribute in aid of the Persian campaign. 
He found, he said, that he had two thousand talents of silver and four millions, wanting seven thousand, of staters of gold. The stator was a Persian coin. Even if we knew, at the present day, its exact value, we could not determine the precise amount denoted by the sum which Pythias named, the value of money being subject to such vast fluctuations in different ages of the world. Scholars who have taken an interest in inquiring into such points as these have come to the conclusion that the amount of gold and silver coin which Pythias thus reported to Xerxes was equal to about thirty millions of dollars. Pythias added, after stating the amount of the gold and silver which he had at command, that it was all at the service of the king for the purpose of carrying on the war. He had, he said, besides his money, slaves and farms enough for his own maintenance. Xerxes was extremely gratified at this generosity and at the proof which it afforded of the interest which Pythias felt in the cause of the king. You are the only man, said he, who has offered hospitality to me or to my army since I set out upon this march, and in addition to your hospitality you tender me your whole fortune. I will not, however, deprive you of your treasure. I will, on the contrary, order my treasurer to pay to you the seven thousand staters necessary to make your four millions complete. I offer you also my friendship, and will do anything in my power, now and hereafter, to serve you. Continue to live in the enjoyment of your fortune. If you always act under the influence of the noble and generous impulses which govern you now, you will never cease to be prosperous and happy. If we could end the account of Pythias and Xerxes here, what generous and noble-minded men we might suppose them to be. But alas, how large a portion of the apparent generosity and nobleness which shows itself among potentates and kings turns into selfishness and hypocrisy when closely examined. Pythias was one of the most merciless tyrants that ever lived. He held all the people that lived upon his vast estates in a condition of abject slavery, compelling them to toil continually in his mines, in destitution and wretchedness, in order to add more and more to his treasures. The people came to his wife with their bitter complaints. She pitied them, but could not relieve them. One day it is said that in order to show her husband the vanity and folly of living only to amass silver and gold, and to convince him how little real power such treasures have to satisfy the wants of the human soul, she made him a great entertainment in which there was a boundless profusion of wealth in the way of vessels and furniture of silver and gold, but scarcely any food. There was everything to satisfy the eye with the sight of magnificence, but nothing to satisfy hunger. The noble guest sat starving in the midst of a scene of unexampled riches and splendor, because it was not possible to eat silver and gold. And as for Xerxes's professions of gratitude and friendship for Pythias, they were put to the test a short time after the transactions which we have above described in a remarkable manner. Pythias had five sons. They were all in Xerxes' army. By their departure on the distant and dangerous expedition on which Xerxes was to lead them, their father would be left alone. Pythias, under these circumstances, resolved to venture so far on the sincerity of his sovereign's professions of regard as to request permission to retain one of his sons at home with his father on condition of freely giving up the rest. 
Xerxes, on hearing this proposal, was greatly enraged. How dare you, said he, come to me with such a demand? You and all that pertain to you are my slaves and are bound to do my bidding without a murmur. You deserve the severest punishment for such an insolent request. In consideration, however, of your past good behavior, I will not inflict upon you what you deserve. I will only kill one of your sons, the one that you seem to cling to so fondly. I will spare the rest. So saying, the enraged king ordered the son whom Pythias had endeavored to retain to be slain before his eyes and then directed that the dead body should be split in two, and the two halves thrown, the one on the right side of the road and the other on the left, that his army, as he said, might march between them. On leaving Phrygia, the army moved on toward the west. Their immediate destination, as has already been said, was Sardis, where they were to remain until the ensuing spring. The historian mentions a number of objects of interest which attracted the attention of Xerxes and his officers on this march, which mark the geographical peculiarities of the country, or illustrate in some degree the ideas and manners of the times. There was one town, for example, situated not like Selene, where a river had its origin, but where one disappeared, the stream was a branch of the meander. It came down from the mountains like any other mountain torrent, and then, at the town in question, it plunged suddenly down into a gulf or chasm and disappeared. It rose again at a considerable distance below, and thence flowed on, without any further evasions, to the meander. On the confines between Phrygia and Lydia, the army came to a place where the road divided. One branch turned toward the north and led to Lydia, the other inclined to the south and conducted to Caria. Here too, on the frontier, was a monument which had been erected by Croesus, the great king of Lydia, who lived in Cyrus's day to mark the eastern boundaries of his kingdom. The Persians were, of course, much interested in looking upon this ancient landmark, which designated not only the eastern limit of Croesus's empire, but also what was, in ancient times, the western limit of their own. There was a certain species of tree which grew in these countries called the plane tree. Xerxes found one of these trees so large and beautiful that it attracted his special admiration. He took possession of it in his own name and adorned it with golden chains and set a guard over it. This idolization of a tree was a striking instance of the childish caprice and folly by which the actions of the ancient despots were so often governed. As the army advanced, they came to other places of interest and objects of curiosity and wonder. There was a district where the people made a sort of artificial honey from grain, and a lake from which the inhabitants procured salt by evaporation, and mines too of silver and of gold. These objects interested and amused the minds of the Persians as they moved along, without, however, at all retarding or interrupting their progress. In due time they reached the great city of Sardis in safety, and here Xerxes established his headquarters and awaited the coming of spring. In the meantime, however, he sent heralds into Greece to summon the country to surrender to him. This is a common formality when an army is about to attack either a town, a castle, or a kingdom. Xerxes's heralds crossed the Aegean Sea and made their demands in Xerxes' name upon the Greek authorities. As might have been expected, the embassage was fruitless, and the heralds returned, bringing with them from the Greeks not acts or proffers 
of submission, but stern expressions of hostility and defiance. Nothing, of course, now remained, but that both parties should prepare for the impending crisis. End of chapter 4